All right. Hi. Thank you all for coming to Reversing Corruption, Seagate Hard Drive Translators, also known as the Naked Trill Data Recovery Project. Because we've had some technical difficulties, I may speak really fast. I'm from New York. I'm sorry. Um, but thank you for all making through the maze and through the confusion to be here. I really appreciate it. My name is Allison. I'm one of several Allison Noctiborns. Uh, I am a software developer by trade. I build high-level blue, blue software. So this has nothing to do with what I do as a day job. I haven't really touched hardware since college where I did a bunch of robotics research and learned that cutting-edge research is the easy part of getting published in IEEE publication. It left a little bit of a mark, about a dozen years' worth of a mark. So that's really it for my hardware experience. I am not an expert in this. That's her. That's her job. So feel free to tell me I'm wrong. That's a slow transition. Look, dude, I'm Mr. Dead. Um, I named the project. It's a play on our last names. You know, uh, Born Naked is her last name in Dutch. Um, I've given tux talks at Hushcon, Teardown, and then Arch Reactor Hackerspace. Uh, I founded Revenant Data, which is a data recovery company in Oregon with Wireglitch, who's somewhere around here. Um, I've co-founded a couple of hackerspaces. Uh, the most recent one, so like Pascal and PDX Hack Labs, I, I, I try to do like uh, workshops on reverse engineering and focusing on assembly and binary challenges. <clears throat> I don't have a formal education. I did not go to Carnegie Mellon University like Allison. Everything that I know is self-taught, like minus, I, I did do Scott Moulton's data recovery training, the remote one. Um, I've never actually met him, which is kind of funny. Um, and I do roller derby and I like stress bake. I get stressed out and I bake stuff. That's my non-infosec hacking stuff. All right. The original quest. <clears throat> we dubbed it the seemingly undamaged HDD in a really bad day. Uh, so what ends up happening is, this is out of order. Well, that's fine. I get a lot of these cases in, translator corruption, which basically means I have zero access to user data or sometimes we'll have partial access. <clears throat> what that, how that manifests is it'll boot, spin, it'll get stuck or never, and by, you know, stuck and busy, it just means not recognized by the host. Uh, and then it never initializes. Another thing that can happen is it will boot, spin, click. Not all clicks are clicks of death. <clears throat> uh, and then it'll spin down. So when that happens, um, especially if there's clicking involved, and this is always the type of corruption that we're talking about occurs in Pharaoh Seagates and Moose Seagates, which I know many of you may not actually be familiar with family names and hard drives, but you can ask me about that later. Um, so when the clicking happens, it usually is indicating the short points problem, uh, which means that I have to short the read pins or short the read points in order to gain terminal access and then force a regeneration of the translator success. That's a little off. That's eh, messed up success, but it's actually never really that easy. Um, it can become an, in, like an extremely awful time sink for me. Uh, like in order to, I have to short these read pins at a very precise time, and then I have to send a control Z to gain terminal access at a very precise time, and it can suck up anywhere between an hour of my time to six hours, I'm not kidding. My uh, partner and I would often have to like switch off because we'd get tired of like sitting there and listening for the heads to leave the platter and then like start mashing control Z. So um, what makes this extremely frustrating is once I get terminal access, forcing the translator regeneration is actually very simple, but it's this timing issue that drives me nuts. Long story short, um, I went to the, the hackerspace and started complaining about this a lot. I really don't like this. Yeah, but anyway... Um, Allison overheard me and I, I said, oh, I want to automate this. I would love to be able to bypass this like four to six hour timing issue of shorting these points and sending a terminal command so that I can just boom, get to the translator regener regeneration. And she chimed in and she's like, oh, I can script that. Um, exactly. I think you said, hey, I need some code. It'll be really easy. I'm yeah. pretty sure that's what you I said. I may have tried to sucker her into it knowing damn well, because I'm not a coder. I don't like, I, I'm very little programming skills. Um, so along the way, while we were doing research to try to solve this particular issue, we started realizing there's a bunch of other little, like, much simpler tools that we could fit or that we could build, and we started doing that because um, the ultimate goal, where we are currently focusing on translators and also just Seagates, 
even more specifically, these two families. However, several of our tools do work on pretty much any Seagate, uh, 7200.12 and beyond. Um, anywho, yeah, we started uh, working on other types of tools that we can fix. We want to turn it into a full-on data recovery suite that's open source. Reasons to care. I know a lot of people think that hard drives are obsolete or near obsolescence, obsolescence, but um, there are some pretty important reasons to care. Number one, right to know, uh, there are standards for hard drives. A lot of you are probably familiar with ATA standards, the uh, INCITS T13 committee, they issue those. Um, the problem is, is majority of these are vendor specific. The tool that we built, we use the um, terminal debug interface that has zero standards. Everything's vendor specific. So if you don't know what you're doing, you either have to send it to a data recovery company, it's gonna cost you an arm and a leg most likely, or you have to sink honestly probably months if not years of research into figuring out what commands can I use? What does this command mean? Um, these lack of standards make it really difficult to like implement quality assurance. And again, you're forced to rely on very costly data recovery tools or services. <coughs> um, right to repair, I wholeheartedly believe ownership is not a timeshare. Uh, it really bugs me that manufacturers want you to use their data recovery services only. Um, again, I think that ultimately drives down QA. Um, they're not compostable and there are a hell of a lot of them, especially when you factor in data centers and the fact that they're still using predominantly spinning disks. Um, they're manufactured with cobalt on the platters. Um, that can, the, it, it can cause neurodegenerative diseases. It's been linked to ALS recently and I do have citations for all this. And then of course silica, also neuro, neurodegenerative diseases. That's you. This podium is freaking me out. All right, so. Ah. Always the space bar. Why are you know Linux? I'm not an adept Linux user. I'm yeah, not, yeah. I'm not even really and apparently I can't use Windows, so I suppose I don't have any stones Just to throw. The space bar. All right, so of the disks that cross Mr. Dead's desk for repair, about 50% of them are Seagates. Of that, just over 8% display translator corruption. This doesn't sound like a ton, but um, scale's a funny thing. So Seagate started shipping drives in 80, 1980, and about 20 years later, they announced that they shipped 250 million hard drives. And they've kept shipping at about that rate. So let's do some bar math. Um, translators really first appeared with the F3 architecture, which was shipped in about 2008. And if we say there are 100 million drives active, then we are looking at north of 8 million cases of translator corruption. So the odds are good if you have a couple drives or you run a data center, it's gonna happen to you. And when it does, you'll find out that this can be really expensive. We did some social engineering and we found that the cost of a translator repair can run you somewhere between 700 and $3,000. And in general, repair on a hard drive can run you north of 8,000. So getting your bits back can be extremely expensive. And I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily have a spare 8K laying around. So that's a reason you should care beside the high-minded stuff. I'm going to try to get through this because I know it's kind of boring, hard drive anatomy. Um, <laughs> uh, number one, filter, not very important. Number two, however, those are the platters, AKA the media, AKA spinning disks, and that's where your data is technically actually stored. Um, what else to pay attention to? Six, the, the heads, right? The read and write elements of the drive. They're gonna fly over the platters, reading and writing data. They're parked on the head ramp there, uh, but honestly, the second or you know third most important element is seven, that's the head stack connector. So that's connected via that number eight, the ribbon, to the actuator arm, and then on the other side, that's touching the PCB. And just remember, I was talking about shorting read points. Well, I have to know where those are because that's what I'm doing. I'm preventing, um, via this solution, the, the read, like the, the heads seeking the service area. It'll stop. I'm tricking it into giving me a debug mode. So, anatomy. Hard disk geometry. Uh, I wanted to bring, like, I wanted you all to kind of have a little bit of background on this because, you know, CHS, this is introducing you to CHS and LBA. Um, <coughs> service area is that 
grayish blue ring around the outside if they're outer parked heads on a ramp. The, it could also be on the inner ring, um, which that would be inner parked heads, so heads are parked on the platter. I can't issue this solution with those types of drives all the time. It's harder because I'm literally listening and also kind of feeling for when the heads are leaving the, the ramp. Um, two, the sectors, which is the S and CHS, um, that is physical location of data. It is the smallest unit of data on the hard drive. 512 bytes of user data, 520 if you factor in ECC error correction code. Um, and is then divided up into cylinders, which are concentrically expanding rings from the center of the drive. Um, if you have multiple platters, that's going all through every platter. Uh, I highlighted it there, number four, that is a cylinder. Those are all cylinders. Some people will dispute and call them tracks. That's a whole big debate. Uh, and then um, that cylinder, again, that would be the C and CHS. The H is the heads. Uh, so cylinder head sector. And a zone, is, that includes like several cylinders. And it is just a way to like aid in translator. But we're not going to get into that. There you go. That's you. Hardware is icky. Let's talk about software instead. And guys in the back, feel free to come in and sit down. We got plenty of seats. So what's inside the firmware that we really care about? Well, one of the most important data structures is the translator. And the translator maps from logical block addresses to cylinder head sectors. Anytime you see the word logical in a name, it's a cue that we made this up. Uh, logical block addresses are an abstraction. CHS represent a location in physical space on the disk. Your translator will map between one and the other and vice versa. Well, how does it do this? Well, like all good data structures or famous hackers, it has a posse. Uh, its posse is made up of defect lists. Um, your translator is a great place to hide things if you don't want the host OS to know they're there. Not that I would encourage you to do this, but in theory, it wouldn't be half bad. So the lists it use as a helper to construct the, the translator as a data structure are two types of lists. We have primary defect lists and grown defects lists. Primary defects are defined as defects that are found at factory or creation. You're either borked or you're not. Sectors are just kind of bad sometimes. We make them. No one makes a perfect disk. Grown defects are the ones that accumulate over time. Flakes of rust, cosmic rays, aliens staring at your hard drive. Stuff just goes bad over time and we know it. So we tend to stick them in two lists. The grown defect list usually has a lot more space than the primary lists because it's the, the size of that tends to determine how long your drive will really stay viable. In Seagates, we find a second form of primary list called the non-resident grown defect list. This showed up in... It showed it up uh, after 7200.12. It doesn't exist in 7200.11. Ask her. The architecture came out in 2008, so around then. But ask me about that later. Anyway, go, go, go. All right. Um, these two lists are created by something in Seagate lingo called a self-scan test. As far as I can tell, it's a QA test they run. Um, and when working with these lists, they appear to largely function as glorified arrays, but I haven't been able to fully prove that's what they really are. They just seem to act a lot like it. So. All right. Let's talk about some lists. No, 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 not lists. This is physical to logical. I was getting there. Oh. Wait, your turn. Wait, I thought this was me. No. Yeah, it's not my me. name on it. What? No, that's we switched. management. All right, well, then you do it. Okay. So how does CHS map to LBA? This is, and, and how do skip lists and remap lists work? That's what this is showing. Up above, uh, the darker blocks is cylinder head sector. Those are the physical blocks, geometric location. Keep in mind, CHS is always oblivious to these defects. It has no idea that, it, that they exist. That's where the translator will come in. The primary lists found at factory, so P-list, NRG list, maybe a few others, we're not entirely sure yet, um, functions like this. So 0, 1, and 2, those are good, those are good blocks, good sectors, and they map identical address-wise to the CHS. Physical block three is bad, so we skip it, and four becomes three, and that's how a skip list work. It's fast. It's significantly faster than remaps, which we will get to now. And an important thing to note from his perspective is they have a limitation. They're static. So we tend to pair them with primary lists because they're expected to be static and unchanging. 
physical, physical to logical via remapping, which is what the grown defects list are. So anything in G list is functioning like a remap. Uh, again, zero and one physically, you know, having the similar, having a same address. We get to two and three. Those are both bad. Um, the heads will, you know, hit that and uh, check the ECC. It doesn't match. It knows, to, translator tells it, okay, go to the reserved area, which ha the heads have to fly to a totally different area. This it can really, really start to increase um, the time that you have to spend, you know, waiting for your data to show up. So a lot of times when your drive's starting to slow down, it can often indicate via smart data, kind of, sort of, don't ever really rely on that, but it can indicate a grown defects list, potentially. If you're in CS, this will cause it to resemble a linked list in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, actually, that's all I got. But if you have more questions, you can talk to me about that later. I know it's kind of it's esoteric. Ah, science translator may be corrupted. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the drive will boot. It'll spin. Um, or it'll do the partial boot. Ultimately, it's never recognized by the host. <coughs> uh, if you're able to get, you know, terminal debug mode, you will see these errors. Pretty much anything that begins with LED is indicative of a translator issue. Uh, that top one there ending in AO51, it's just kind of like a classic stuck in busy. Uh, could, could be, you know, lists need to be merged or the G list needs to be purged. Uh, the second one there ending in A7E5 pretty much always means in a Faro or a Moose drive that I'm going to have to do the shorting of the read points in order to gain terminal access. Um, the SIM errors down here, any SIM error that you see that's like 1000 through 1008, probably uh, corrupted defects list, don't really know which one, you'd have to research that or memorize it over time. SIM error 1009 pretty much always means uh, corrupted G list, which is something that one of our tools can fix. Um, but those are things to look for in terminal debug mode if you ever decide to do this for fun or, you know, you. I came up with a plan worthy of a Bond villain. It is foolproof. It cannot possibly fail. So we're going to corrupt a translator in a controlled manner because I like properly testing my software, run it through a manual fix, take some notes, take some numbers, model with a program, test it on some unsuspecting members of our hackerspace, and profit. Who's written software before? Show of hands. Or played with proprietary hardware. Yeah. Yeah, you all know where this is going. Unsurprisingly, we ran into a few problems. So initially, we were expecting to find three lists. The P list, the NRG list, which is that second form of P list, and an NRG list, right? When we start splunking in the hardware, we find two out of three. So far, so good. We are on track. I'm feeling good about it. It's warm and fuzzy. Warm and fuzzy never lasts. I'm the reason I can't have nice names. So instead of finding one G list, we found three, which became our first problem. Which of these grown defects lists are we going to try to overfill, and are they all really G actually G lists? Because we just sort of found a bunch of lists and had to figure out what they were, what they did, and whether they were actually useful. So, If you were confused by the remap, the physical to, to logical remap, ask me later what is copied and why that happens and how. Alrighty. Anyway. So we ended up trying to fill some of these lists and seeing what the drive did and seeing if we got the sort of signs of corruption we were expecting. We ultimately settled on the eponymous G list. It's the first one at the top. And that's the one we used for the rest of our experiments and testing. So that's the, that's the list we settled on for future use. We also found these two. Um, they're called slip lists. That means we found a total of seven lists here when we were expecting three. It's a little crowded in there. They aren't relevant to this talk, and we're not entirely sure what they do, but we found them and we wanted to share that in case they're useful to other people. So we, we expected that we'd sort of fill the list by hand once, it'd fall over at 2,000 entries, we'd move on. Uh, that's not how that went. So initially... Mr. Dead here added 3,000 some odd entries by hand. 3,500. Not that she was counting. Uh, I added about 34 before wanting to throw at the wall and deciding pie cereal was the lesser of two evils. Promptly scripted that. So even then I'm like, all right, we'll run it overnight. It'll be done. 
Well, we ended up north of 6,000 entries, and the translator wouldn't corrupt. And we're like, we don't think it has that much space. It shouldn't have that much space. We've run some numbers. We think it should only have like two gigs. And it finally dawned on me that the translator was actually a little bit smarter than I'd given it credit for, and it was adding entries sequentially and just skipping the entire block. We were basically telling it that contiguous memory was bad, and it was like, okay, contiguous memory is bad. We'll just skip that. So I ended up having to add a randomizer to the script so it would add random jumps so that it couldn't block it. Uh, even then, we found that the list had way more space. We were expecting it to fall over at 2,000 entries, and it usually takes between 4,000 and 5,000 for it to, to fall over. Um, the drive didn't like being up for a lot of that. If you look at the far screen over there, you'll see the drive powering down in the middle of me doing things. So we found that we also had to batch it and give the drive pauses between stuff. And you'll see on the left, that's the screen attached in the diagnostic mode. And it's got way fewer entries in its GLIS than I was expecting it to have, which was sort of my tip off that it was doing something smarter. I'm a little embarrassed to say it took me a while to see that. I just sort of thought I was doing it wrong. Or wiring it backward, which happened a lot. All right. So firmware is really weird, was the third problem I personally ran into. What does level 6 E2 do? Any takers? This creates user batch file 0. Uh, how about level T, I4, parameters 1, you already know the answer. You can clean the erasers after class. This clears the glist. I have no idea how this corresponds to clearing the glist, but it does. And so if anyone ever says this to you. Oh, oh too quick. Every time you say code is self-documenting, God kills a kitten. Yeah. Why well, you ruined my punchline? Ah. I've been waiting 10 years to use this picture from my coworker's desk. I'm sorry. Um, so Seagate firmware is extremely non-self-documenting, and that can be very difficult to work with when you have to rely on partially transcribed Chinese manuals found We're on watching. sketching FTP ser servers. The other problem we ran into that isn't really on a slide because I didn't think it needed a slide was that we also ran into differences between firmware, like different behavior, different output. Some commands that we expected output from didn't output in the Apple firmware version, and it took us a lot of headbanging to figure that out. So when you are messing with this, you can't even count on output to be consistent across commands to tell you whether something succeeded or not. In some cases, the Apple version just doesn't do anything if it succeeds or if it fails. You just have to try later and see if it actually did something. So again, that timing issue and why I want it to automate this, because it takes forever. Um, this is just a little graph that Allison made. It's the results of several timing tests recorded um, during our attempts at the manual fix to short the points problem. Um, this is from powering on the drive to me hearing, listening for the heads to seek the service area. What's not shown is the timing between shorting the points and sending control Z. Uh, we didn't include that because we never actually got that far. Um, as you can see, there's a huge variance. Um, I think it was roughly between like 4.28 or something like that. Uh, up to like almost 6.4 or something. Um, this is only from a single drive, and we spent about two hours with zero success. Uh, so this was, you know, we had successfully corrupted the drive by overfilling the G list, and here we are trying to figure out, well, how are we going to script this timing issue? And we're still not there. So. All right, so to recap, we had some surprises. There were more lists than we anticipated. We ended up stumbling around trying to figure out which one. The translator was smarter than I expected by actually a fair amount. Firmware is extremely weird. It has differences. And the glist was a lot larger than we anticipated, which did significantly slow us down in places because I expected to be able to fill that sucker in four hours and it takes closer to 48. Yeah, data recovery technicians and professionals are patient when we're working, and then in the rest of life, we're kind of assholes, I think. But uh, some other problems we ran into, um, you know, we're only human, we're mere mortals, uh, lots of human errors. Software engineer can't hardware, hardware engineer can't software. She crossed wires, I don't know how many times, probably wasted about four hours on just confusing TX, RX, and maybe not even having ground in, which I think she did actually kill one of our drives by not having ground in. Uh, and then I failed, I, I was trying to, you know, I, 
use the, her script that she wrote to intentionally corrupt. I didn't read the documentation, so I'm just like, go, go, go. Nothing's happening, Allison. And I went back to manually inputting. That was, that was pretty awful. Uh, I also poked through the PCB when trying to short the points. Um, but it's okay, I have so many of these to play with. Uh, the significant timing variance, um, the command output that we're waiting for in order to verify anything could take between one second. She put six minutes. Realistically, it's like 10 minutes. It could be 10 minutes even with really, really expensive, awesome data recovery tools like the PC3000. Had to wait upwards of 10 minutes with the PC3000. Um, Pi Serial was less reliable. Don't use it on Windows. Um, I'm not the best Linux user at all, but this forced me to learn a lot more and sort of get away from Windows, so don't judge me, please. All right, so where we're at now, now that we've yammered at you for some background and our experimental progress and emotional journey, we can consistently reverse corruption if diagnostic mode is available. So if you see SIM error 11009, we know we can always reverse that. That one works very well. We can consistently corrupt our target drive, so I do have good test environments now. We, so if you want to play with reversing corruption, we can get you a drive that is in shape for that. The unfortunate thing is, though, is we haven't been able to reproduce the original target solution on our corrupted drives. Because of the variance in timing and the fact that I don't have a way to programmatically detect where the heads are, I'm not actually convinced that we'll ever really get to a fully automated fix for the original problem. But that doesn't stop us from trying. One more time. Ta. All right. So before we show you code, the development philosophy for this project is a little bit different. I generally believe that not all, not all hackers are coders. It's a little bit of a controversial opinion these days in some circles, but I do believe that. And I have met some very technical people in the data recovery community who can't read or write code for, for anything. Like that one. For, not, not that I would be so crass as to name names at a podium while we're being recorded. Anyway, so this makes my, spirit, my hacker spirit sad. And the whole point of this project is that the data privacy community has to... Data recovery. There was not a count of caffeine in that latte, I'm saying. They have to operate with this giant veil of secrecy. Manufacturers are withholding information. A lot of it's proprietary. People who make tools are extremely secretive. The large companies that do data recovery do not share. So our goal is to make this open. And if you can't read the code, then you don't really know what it's doing, and you haven't learned. Code represents intelligence. So this code has been written with those people in mind. If you are a developer and you are a purist, avert thine eyes because there are flagrant violations of dry. It is over-commented from a developer perspective and it is very procedural and it will basically piss off anyone who writes code professionally. I'm okay with that because they're not my target audience. I want people who do data recovery to be able to read it. It's in Python for two reasons. One, because it's the lingua franca of security and it's our poison of choice, but also because in my experience teaching people, it is the easiest type of code for non-coders to understand. It is also GPLv3 because we are interested in making this sure this information stays open. There's already a bunch of proprietary and closed stored stuff. I'm not interested in spending my precious free time adding to that. So if you want to yell at me about the license choice, feel free. Go for it. Uh, please file your bugs with this, this philosophy in mind. It is a little bit different. So to the meat of it, what you're going to need to implement this at home with one of your Faro or Moose Seagate drives. Um, side note, I wasn't entirely comfortable with this. I'm definitely very used to my expensive fun tools. Uh, but I very much want this to become open source. So to do this entire thing, if you already have the drive, shouldn't cost you more than 15 bucks. You just need a USB to TTL adapter with the FTDI chip FT232 access to the ground pin, so you're going to have to shell your drive. Um, if you have, a, if you're not using one of the adapters that has, you know, shared power with the host, you're going to need a power adapter. You'll need the code, which you can find on her GitHub. Uh, you'll need Pi Serial module. We strongly encourage and incur well, we encourage you install screen to issue a sanity check to make sure that you are in fact connected to the hard drive and that you can send these commands, that you can cause corruption and reverse corruption. Uh, we also strongly encourage that you never use this on a hard drive with data that you give a damn about. Uh, don't. 
Um, you do have to match it in a very particular way. Um, all hard drives are broken up into these really bizarre like uh, families and lots of other things. Um, generally, with the, the Seagate, Moose, and Pharaoh, match the model number. You can ID it if it's a good drive via the debug mode, and I can like you know. We'll document that somewhere. There's a special command you can send for that. Um, if not, you can kind of go off the model number. Faro and Moose drives almost always end in something something AS with the model number. Uh, match the firmware versions because, again, this the exact specific type of corruption we were trying to fix with the shorting of the read points um, in order to gain terminal access doesn't occur in a couple of, like, Apple. Well, it can occur there, but it's difficult to fix um, because when it's seeking the service area and at what points it's reading the service area are different than in other firmware. The Dell-specific firmware, JC4A, we were never able to get corruption. I don't know why. I don't know if it's somehow impervious to G-list overfill. I'd have to do a lot more research to figure that out. This is our setup. Um, that's my little uh, pin or uh, read point shorting tool that I... It's just tweezers, and I tried to space them uh, as perfectly apart to quickly hit the read points, which are in the middle there, and the, yeah, it's just solder wrapped around the, wrapped around there trying to bridge it. It's a really shoddy setup, and I'm embarrassed by it, I guess. Um, <laughs> and yeah, those are the read points we're aiming for when we're, you know, right after power on, listening for it to leave, uh, listening for the heads to leave. And then uh, once we actually did reach corruption, because we have done that, uh, I just wanted to verify it in one of my fancy tools, so it's hooked up to the PC2000 over there. They have these fancy terminal connectors that are way better than way better than that, <laughs> um, much less likely to cause connectivity issues. Um, so yeah, when you're doing this, just make sure that you know, you're know you crisscrossing your RX and TX from host to device. Um, it's like honestly kind of a, a, kind of a trek to even figure out what pins are TX, RX on the drives. Um, so TX is always closest to uh, the SATA, then RX right next to it, and then ground is the very last. So we didn't show the power connector. It's there. Please be very careful. Um, there's a lot that you can do to destroy your drive and never get access to your data again. So again, if you're going to be doing this, choose, it, choose to start with a drive you don't care about at all. And before you start, very first thing, back up the service area, which, yes, you can do via terminal debug mode commands. You can save that way. Um, ask me about that later. But definitely, definitely, definitely back up the service area. All right, so you've got your equipment, you're ready to go. Please get your software installed in order. Remember to give it executable permissions. Hook up the connectors. Double check your connectors. If you're in software, have someone in hardware check your connectors. Determine what port your OS has been assigned. Rerun the scripts. Read the, I'd say read the documentation before you start, but I'm a realist and know that nobody does that, apparently. So... Before you hit run, please read the documentation because the order of the LBA addresses you enter matters. So, yeah, running this once you get it, all your stuff and set up and are good to go is actually pretty quick. However, there is one gotcha I do want to mention. So, as we mentioned earlier, some of those, re especially when you get a full G list, your remap operations get really, really slow. And we did see some of the commands to add entries take north of 10 minutes to fully execute. So the script will time out. You'll see received byte zero. In the setup, you can see on the left that we are actually getting the sectors reassigned, i.e. added to the glist, even though the script says we got nothing back. This is because I went and made T and came back, and there was the output. So be aware that if you see receive zero, it's not an indication that the operation failed. It just means it was taking longer than the script was willing to wait. So don't freak if you see those. All right, so what's next? This is the shameless plug for help. We would like to try solving the original problem without shorting. We'd like to write, a, write some code to configure the translator to rebuild based on the list you specify. You may remember that we have seven of them to pick from. I'm guessing you'll get some different behavior and some different performance if you rebuild the translator with different lists. We'd like to expand this to include other Seagate families or even better, other manufacturers. Could potentially do this with the ATEA commands because they are not specific to Seagate. So... Again, long-term goal, we would like an open-source data recovery suite uh, so that people don't have to spend an arm and a leg or, you know, 
hundreds to up to 10 grand sometimes on data recovery. Um, <laughs> feature requests, again, our current focus is on translators and defects list issues. Uh, we do want to expand to include other solutions and of course other manufacturers. Um, code contributions, just make sure you please keep Allison's philosophy in mind. Uh, you know, make this for people that don't know how to code. Um, we would love help testing that doesn't always include just writing scripts. There's other things that I would definitely like help with and you can ask me about that later if you're interested. Um, open knowledge about the firmware. All this, again, data recovery is super, super, super secretive. The manufacturers are secretive. Other data recovery companies are very secretive. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. There's a lot of digging. Uh, there's some great forums out there. HDD Oracle is one of my favorite. Um, I highly recommend you visit that if you haven't. So, acknowledgements. Um, speaking of HDD Oracle, uh, I really want to thank Spilled It. I've never met him, but he founded HDD Oracle, and he's just a fantastic researcher. Um, just wants to, he loves what he does, and he's not in it to make money. Um, and I think that's it. And then, if you want, I'd like to thank Lead Bunny and the two goons who sprinted over oh, yeah. Cross Hotels to get us a projector at T minus five minutes, because I don't think I could have done that. No. Yeah, Leap Bunny's awesome. He's always wearing a green hat, pretty much. Definitely buy him food or booze or something. And then bibliography you can find on my GitHub that I never use, or that little URL, which is totally safe, I promise. And if something happens, find Dean Pierce. He owns it. Okay, so we were supposed to take five minutes of questions, but because we got such a late start, we're going to take all of our questions over under the Hardware Hacking Village sign to try to keep this room as on schedule as it is feasible to be at DEF CON. So thank you all for coming. Thanks for fording the maze. We look forward to seeing you over there to have a longer conversation.